Hello and uh, welcome to a, another installation of uh, Biology in Focus. Um, today we're going to start with uh, chapter 27, which is going to be the first chapter in Unit 3, uh, Animal Physiology. Um, so you're going to skip around in your books a little bit. Uh, turn to chapter 27 and follow along the rise of animal diversity. This is a lecture for John Tyler Community College, and my name is Mr. Sparks, and I will be taking you through this lecture. <laughs> okay, overall, uh, most animals are mobile and use traits such as strength, speed, toxins, or camouflage to detect, capture, and eat their organisms. For example, the chameleon captures insect prey with its long, sticky, fast-moving tongue. Uh, here we have a Madagascar chameleon, and you can see it's uh, it's being fed a cricket, and it uh, flings out its tongue and uh, captures the cricket cricket this this way, and then brings it back into its uh, into its mouth, where it travels through the digestive tract and uh, is remitted as waste on the other end. Okay, so the chameleon is a pretty uh, um, a stealthy and slow moving animal and it has the ability to uh, match the background pattern uh, and color that it, in the area that it's traveling. If you put a chameleon on different colored patterns um, it will it will assume those those that coloration. It's really quite an amazing animal. Most of them are from Africa or Madagascar. Animals originated more than 700 million years ago. <clears throat> so, almost three quarters of a billion years ago, current evidence indicates that animals evolved from single-celled eukaryotes similar to present-day coanoflagellates. So these are, when we're talking about animals evolving 700 million years ago, we're not talking about vertebrates, we're not talking about chameleons, we're talking about ancestral, uh, one-celled, multicellular, uh, eukaryotes um, that have uh, very primitive characteristics. More than 1.3 million animal species have been named to date. The actual number of species is estimated to be nearly 8 million. So uh, taxonomists think that there are a number of different species that haven't been uh, found and described yet. Those are prob primarily um, uh, you know, small uh, multicellular animals or um, possibly even uh, uh, single-cell protists and what have you. Uh, there are still um, multicell, there are still large vertebrates that are being discovered. Uh, every so often in Southeast Asia, they uh, recently turned up a new jungle cat a couple of years ago. And every so often they'll find what they call a uh, crypto species, which is a, a species that looks like another species but has uh, certain genetic characteristics that make it distinct. And so these all can account for this great number of animal species. Fossil biochemical, I think you should say fossil and biochemical evidence and molecular clock studies date the common ancestor of all living animals to the period between 700 and 770 million years ago. Early members of the animal fossil record include the Edicarian biota, which dates back 560 uh, million years ago. Okay, so the Edicarian actually preceded the, Cra the Cambrian um, explosion, which was a time when uh, a great number of uh, animal species came into being. But the Ediacarian is when the uh, first um, multicellular uh, primitive animals uh, began, to, began to evolve and began to be captured by the fossil record. Okay, here's Dixonia costata. This is like a, a little organism. It's probably like a limpet, um, maybe a, a mollusk or, or a similar organism. And then here's a fossil mollusk, uh, Kimberellia which is like a um, cowrie shell. Um, it, is, uh, it, it, it is also an ancient fossil. Okay. Um, Dixonia costata. 
fossil mollusk Kimberella. Okay, sponges and nidarians are two early diverging groups of animals. So the sponges, sponges are alive today, and they are the most primitive um, animal. That's probably going to be on your test, so you want to make a note of that. Um, sponges and nidarians are, and snidarians, nidarians are two early li diverging groups of animals. Okay, so they are uh, really primitive organisms, and we're going to go and describe them in greater detail here. The animal phylum, animals in the phylum Periphera are informally known as the sponges. And the sponges that you use to wash your dishes and everything, those are artificial um, uh, recreations uh, engineered based on the original sponge plant. I don't know how many of you are, are familiar with, um, with uh, sponges, um, but they are... Uh, you can they they are they are they are basically what we used in the past are are as sponges are actual the skeletons of these actual animals sponges are filter feeders they capture food particles suspended in the water that passes through their body water is drawn through the pores into a central cavity and out through the opening of the top at the top in one of our labs we're going to look at some of these uh, a, a dye that has passed through these um, sponges and it really travels at, is, at, a, at a remarkable rate. Sponges lack true tissues, um, groups of cells that function as a unit. So a sponge, you can actually smash up a sponge and uh, the different parts of the sponge, uh, the coanocytes, the amoebocytes, and the spicules, all these different structural parts of the sponge, we're going to go over those here shortly. But you can smash them up and push them through a sieve until they're just a bunch of goo. And then they will actually reassemble themselves into a sponge. They don't have true tissues in that way. They can be, because they do not have true tissues, they can reorganize themselves. Okay, so here's a schematic of a sponge. Um, uh, sponges draw waters in through these pores. Uh, the water has... Uh, uh, you know, floating material in it, maybe uh, bacteria or other prokaryotes or perhaps simple uh, protists that the, um, that the sponge then captures. Um, the, the sponge, uh, the coanocytes are these cells here that are the most complicated looking cells and they have a little flagellum or a, a whisk and they, uh, they draw the water um, into the into the um, the uh, collar of the coanocyte. Uh, here's a better description over here, up to the right-hand corner. Um, and they and they these uh, coanocytes then draw in the food particles, and they pass these food car particles to the amoebocyte. And the amoebocyte um, uses the food particles, or it travels the food particles to other parts of the sponge, um, where that the that food particles may be necessary. Um, here are spicules, which are generally uh, little particles of silicate um, that are uh, um, extracted as part of the function of the sponge, and they help form the structure of the sponge itself. So here's what a sponge looks like in nature. It's got a basket shape. It's drawing the water in through it. It's capturing these food particles in the coanocytes. Um, uh, the food particles get trapped in there, and then they make their way, you know, through the coanocyte. Whatever the coanocyte does not use, uh, it, tra it passes to the amoebocyte, and the amoebocyte then either uses that material or travels to another part of the sponge where it um, delivers that food particle to the rest of the sponge organism. So it functions as an animal, as a single unified being. Joanocytes are flagellated collar cells that generate a water current through the sponge and ingest suspended food. Morphological similarities between choanocytes and choanoflagellates, choanoflagellates are simple uh, protists that form colonies, are consistent with the hypothesis that animals evolved from choanoflagellate-like ancestor. Amoebocytes are 
mobile cells that play roles in digestion and structure. Okay, now we're going to talk about cnidarians. Cnidarians, the most common cnidarian that everyone knows is the jellyfish. Like most animals, members of the phylum cnidaria have true tissues. Cnidarians are one of the oldest groups of animals, dating back to 680 million years ago. Cnidarians have diversified and into a wide range of sessile and motile forms. Sessile means that it's attached to a, a point, um, and motile means that it's capable of movement, in, including hydrozoans, jellies, and sea anemones. Okay, hydrozoans are like hydras, like those freshwater uh, hydras that you can find in, in pond water. Jellies are jellyfish and sea anemones. I think we're all familiar with sea anemones. We'll explore these in detail here. Okay, if you want to look at these videos, you can go back to the, um, the uh, PowerPoint that I have on the website and you can try to view these videos. Okay, here's a hydrozoa on the left. It's like uh, um, generally hydras are affiliated with uh, fresh water, but they, I think this is a marine hydrozoa. Um, it's just like uh, it has uh, little. Uh, the, one of the characteristics of the cnidarians is that they have a stinging cell, and the stinging cell will help it capture protists or fish. And um, it, it'll shoot out like a little harpoon and it'll pull it into the central portion of the, of the organism here where it will begin the, to be digested. And then these are all just holdfasts that hold the, the uh, hydrozoan into its place on the, on the uh, in this case I believe this is the sea floor. Here are Scyphozoa. Scyphozoa are the, are the free swimming jellyfish. Um, you can really see their distinct uh, tissues here. They have a gastrovascular cavity that they they sting their prey with their with their uh, nematocysts and then pull the stunned fish or protus uh, prim primarily fish with these larger jellies and they pull it into the central part of the gastrovascular cavity and there they digest it and then the digested material is moved. Um, throughout the jellyfish in the gastrovascular cavity to the other tissues um, that make up the jelly. Okay, here is a sea anemone. Um, you always see a clownfish with the sea anemones. Clownfish are immune to the barbs of the of the sea anemone, but the sea anemones do have nematocysts, just like the other cnidarians and they, uh, they use the nematocyst to sting fish and then they'll bring the fish into the center part of the, of the, um, of the sea anemone and uh, they'll push it in there with their arms and then digest, the, digest the, the fish or the organism that they capture and then it, will, um, it has a gastrovascular cavity just like the jellyfish and just like the hydrozoa and it will um, digest that material and um, you know, transfer it around to the needed tissues. The, the sea anemones also have a, a um, hold fast and they just uh, stick on to the bottom like on a coral reef or a rock or what have you and they stick there and they stay uh, in, in one place. These are sessile organisms. The anthozoa, the sea anemones are sessile, the hydrozoas are sessile, and the scaphozoa, the jellies, are motile. So that's the difference between sessile and motile. Okay, here's the hydrozoa in greater detail. The scaphozoa, the jellies, and the and sea anemone, the anthozoa. So these are all very primitive animals. Even though they look like plants, they are in fact animals. The basic body plan of a cendarian is a sac with a di central digestive compartment called the gastrovascular cavity. A single opening functions as mouth and anus. Cendarians are carnivores that use tentacles to capture prey. Cendarians have no brain, but instead they have a non-centralized nerve net associated with sensory structures uh, distributed throughout the body. So they do have a nervous system. It's just it, it's not centralized the way uh, it is in um, 
in some of the other organisms that we're going to look at, but they do have a nervous capacity. The diversity of large animals increased dramatically during the Cambrian explosion. Okay, the Cambrian explosion 535 to 525 million years ago marks the earliest fossil appearance of many groups of large living man, man, animals. So it's thought that during the Ediacarian there were many soft-bodied species and a few of these were fossilized, but during the Cambrian explosion there was increased competition and predation and other um, uh, ecological interactions that were happening from these uh, um, uh, this great uh, diversity of animals emerging and uh, part of those characteristics were hard parts so these hard parts enabled the the um, animals of the Cambrian explosion to be more likely to be fossilized. Strata formed during the Cambrian explosion contain the oldest fossils of about half of all extant animal phyla. Okay, here are some of the uh, living animal phyla that are believed to have e evolved during the Cambrian period. Okay, you can see like here during the Ediacarian, we had the Snidarians and the sponges, a lot of soft-bodying animals uh, during this period. And then during the Cambrian, they call this the Cambrian explosion. It was when there was a vast amount of uh, different phylum that evolved during this period. This included... The, uh, the arthropods, um, here exemplified by a lobster, uh, the mollusks, uh, the annelids, the worms, the brachiopods, which are, um, they were like, uh, similar to mollusks. Uh, they, are, have their, they have a two-sided shell, but uh, there's, there, there's a very few species that are existent today. Um, they've become very rare, although they were once very common. Uh, chordates, um, okay, so this is, uh, this is our phylum here, and the echinoderms, okay, this is the um, sea stars and sea nettles. Um, these, are, uh, these are the echinoderms, um, sea urchins, that's what I meant to say, sea stars and sea urchins. Okay, so also here are the snidarians and the sponges. The, and this is the common an, animal ancestor down here off to the left, down this little branching point here. This would be a choanoflagellate, a colonial choanoflagellate that then gave rise to the sponges, all right, and then an offshoot here. And then you can see how these different animals are related. Uh, we can tell that, that, that their emergence over different periods of time over the fossil record. Fossils from the Cambrian period included the first hard mineralized skeletons. Most fossils from this period are of bilaterians, the clade whose members have a complete digestive tract and bilaterally symmetric form. So these are the bilaterians, and then this is a major group of uh, the invertebrates, and the bilaterians ultimately gave rise to the chordates, the chordates gave rise to the vertebrates, and the vertebrates to the tetrapods, and on down the line, that's eventually our lineage, the lineage of the human beings. Okay, so here are, um, this is an artist's reconstruction of a diverse array of organisms found in the fossils from the Burgess Shale site in British Columbia. Uh, this is a site that's a major um, fossil bed of uh, Cambrian fossils. The animals include the Picaia, an eel-like chordate up here at the top left, um, the Morella, a uh, swimming arthropod, swimming at the left here. This is kind of like a ancestral to the trilobite. Uh, Anomalocaris, this is a large animal with anterior grasping limbs and a circ circular mouth. So this is like the major predator of the time. It was probably about, it could attain a size of like, you know, four to six feet long. So they're pretty big animals. Um, and hallucinogenia, this is an animal with toothpick-like spikes on, on the sea floor at here, at the, uh, here and, and, and then also at the inset here. When they first found fossils of these organisms, they, they thought that they were just piece parts of some other animals that had fallen off and collected 
into a particular area, but then they found more and more of these fossils. And so they, even though they could hardly, scarcely believe that they were really an animal, they ultimately had to, uh, uh, had to determine that they were as such. And so they named them hallucinogenia because they couldn't believe they existed. There are several hypotheses regarding the cause of Cambrian explosion and the decline of the Ediacarian biota. A new predator play relationships came in. Um, uh, there was a there may have been a rise in atmospheric oxygen due to the um, prokaryotic organisms, the uh, uh, photosynthetic organisms that were releasing uh, more and more oxygen into the atmosphere and the evolution of the Hox gene complex. So these are genes that are uh, capable of being uh, acted upon by evolutionary forces and they um, can, contain, can take uh, certain traits and, ex and they may exist in previously in one population but they are not exist, they're not expressed and then they become expressed through uh, natural selection into the next population. Molecular clock estimates that the date of the bilaterans to 100 a million years ago, earlier than the earliest fossil, which is 560 million years ago. So the bilaterans existed um, before there was a, was a record of them in the fossil, um, the fossil record. The appearance of larger, well-defended eukaryotes, 635 to 542 million years ago, indicates that bilaterian pre predators may have it originated by that time. Okay, here's Valeria, a roughly spherical um, uh, pro uh, small organism. Um, it is uh, basically, it's a, these are a small, small eukaryotes here. Um, they, they, during this period of time, there was no structural defenses. They were soft-bodied organisms. And then later in time, uh, during the uh, Cambrian period, um, these uh, similar organisms had evolved to structural defenses. So they were about five times larger than Valeria, and they were covered in hard spines. So this indicates that uh, predation may have been and, and a force that acted on these organisms over time. Diverse animal groups radiated in the aquatic environments. Animals in the early Cambrian oceans were very diverse in morphology, way of life, and taxonomic affiliation. So all of this is happening in the aquatic environment, particularly in the marine environment. That's where we're getting most of our fossils, and, all, and there, there doesn't seem to be any land-dwelling organisms until much later in, in evolutionary history. Zoologists sometimes categorize animals according to a body plan a set of morphological or develop and developmental traits. There are three important aspects of the body plans. Their symmetry, the type of tissues that they have, or the existence of tissues, and the body cavities, the type of body cavities that are involved in those, in, in those uh, animals. These all give us clues to their evolutionary relationship. Animals can be categorized according to the symmetry of their bodies or lack of it. And some animals have radial symmetry with front and with no front and back or left and right. Okay, so here's a classic example of radial symmetry. You see here on the top left that is a, a sea anemone and it just has a radial symmetry. It has the arms that stick out all over in all directions. It's circular in form. Um, if you cut it up into four pieces or six pieces or eight pieces, each piece is going to be basically the same. Um, so, if, and then if you look at bilateral symmetry down on the bottom, uh, bilateral symmetry, these are the bilaterians. 
Um, the, this including the arthropods. This is a lobster here. You can't cut the lobster in four different pieces and get equal uh, equal size pieces, equal shaped pieces. You can, uh, but you can cut it directly down the middle, directly in half. And this is just like human beings. We have bilateral symmetry. Okay, we do not have radial symmetry. We have bilateral symmetry. So th there's only one way you can cut human beings and get uh, parallel sides on each each side, and that is uh, bilateral symmetry. Two-sided symmetry is called bilateral symmetry. Bilaterally symmetrical animals have a dorsal top side and a ventral bottom side, a right side and a left side, anterior head and posterior tail ends. Many also have sensory equipment concentrated in the anterior end, including a brain in the head. So this is the process called cephalization. And a, ce uh, uh, a cephalopod is like a, a squid or a octopus. Those are organisms that have a de definite head. So, um, well, that means head, foot, cephalopod. So uh, not to confuse you any further, but cephalization is the, is the evolutionary process by which um, Nerve, the central nervous system begins to coalesce and there become, be, uh, becomes a prominent end for which that central nervous system is guided and that is where the brain develops. Okay, so many also have central equipment concentrated in the anterior end, including a brain in the head. Radial Radial symmetrical animals are often sessile or planktonic. They drifting or weakly s s swimming. Okay, so plankton is that part of the ocean which includes uh, photosynthetic um, protists and bacteria and zooplankton, uh, plankton that are <clears throat> that feed on those uh, photosynthetic bacteria and protists. And uh, plankton is just means that it, it's, uh, it's at the mercy of the currents. It floats around with the currents. Bilateral animals often move actively and have a central nervous system enabling coordinated movement. Okay, so bilateral animals tend to be more independent. Animal body plans also vary accordingly according to the organization of the animal's tissue. Tissues are collective, uh, collections of specialized cells isolated from other tissues by membranous layers. During development, three germ layers give rise to the tissues and organs of the animal embryo. Okay, here are the um, tissue layers in bilaterians. There's the body cavity. Um, uh, well, let's start from the outside going in. Let's see. There's the body ca uh, covering. This is uh, from the ectoderm of the embryo. Uh, the tissue layer of it on the interior of that is called the mesoderm. And then in, inside, which becomes the digestive tract, is the endoderm. So going from inside out, there's the, in, there's the endoderm the mesoderm, and the ectoderm. The organ systems of bilaterally symmetric animals develop from three germ layers that form in the embryo. Blue represents the tissue derived from the ectoderm, red from the mesoderm, and yellow from the endoderm. The internal organs of most bilaterians are suspended in a body cavity, a fluid or air-filled space that helps protect the organs from injury. The ectoderm is the germ layer covering the embryo's surface. Endoderm is the innermost germ layer and lines the developing digestive tube called a archenteron. Snedarians have only these two germ layers. Mesoderm is the... Okay, Snedarians, Snedarians only have those two layers, the ectoderm and the endoderm. The mesoderm is a third germ layer that fills the space between the ectoderm and the endoderm in all bilaterally symmetric animals. Most bilaterians possess a body cavity, a coelom, 
that a fluid-filled or air-filled space between the digestive tract and the outer body wall. The body cavity may cushion suspended organs, act as a hydrostatic skeleton, or enable internal organs to move independently of the body wall. So the coelom is an important uh, evolutionary adaptation that allows for more freedom in movement. Zoologists recognized about three dozen animal phyla. Phylogenies now combine molecular data from multiple sources with morphological data to undermine, to determine the relationships among phyla. Okay, so here is a diagram of phylogenetic tree. This is the current hypothesis of animal phylogeny. The bilaterians are divided into three main lineages, the deuterostomes, the lophotrochozoans, and the ecdysozoans. These are all uh, based on how the embryo develops. Uh, the dates of origin identified here are based on a two, 2011 molecular clock study. Okay, so here is the um, bilateria, bilateria. This is the important clade of invertebrates that we're studying right now. Um, <clears throat> I want to point out a couple of things here to you. Okay, here's the ecdysozoa. These include the, ne the nematodes and the arthropods. So nematodes are more closely related to arthropods than uh, we previously believed. These are the lophotrochozoa. These include the flatworms, rotifers, uh, the ectoprocta, the brachiopoda, like I said, there's, they're pretty rare nowadays, the mollusks, and the annelids. So uh, earthworms and mollusks are more closely related to each other than earthworms and nematodes. Now here's a really something interesting to think about. These are the deuterostomes. Uh, this is the way that the, the embryo forms... Uh, the embryo forms for the uh, deuterostomes, the, um, the, uh, the first hole becomes the anus and the second hole becomes the mouth. Um, what's interesting here is that uh, you have the, uh, the, the phylum chordata and the phylum echinodermata here. They're, they're actually pretty closely related. So the starfish is is an is a deuterostome and the chordates are a deuterostome and what what animals evolve from the chordates eventually the vertebrates come from the chordates and the, from the vertebrates come the tetrapods from the tetrapods come the all the way down you follow it it goes to the human beings so human beings are actually more closely related to the echinodermata to the starfish than they are to um, any of these other invertebrates. So the, the um, chordates are just one of these many um, invertebrate phylum, but they are an important phylum to us because this is the phylum that, that what generated our, ultimately generated our species. The following points are reflected in the animal phylogeny. All animals share a common ancestor. Sponges are basal animals. Okay, we talked about that in the beginning. Eumetazoa is a clade of animals, the eumetazoans, with true tissue. So that includes the, uh, it does not include the sponges, but it does include the cnidarians and the bilaterians. Most animal phyla belong to the clade bilateria and are called bilaterians. Most animals are invertebrates lacking a backbone. The chordata is the only phylum that includes the vertebrates, animals with the backbone. So you can see we're working from a large scope down here into a, into a smaller scope and we're ultimately talking about the vertebrates which is, which is our uh, class. Bilaterians have diversified into three major clades, the Lophotrochozoa, the Ecdysozoa, and the Deuterostomia. Okay, so these are all the three major clades of bilaterians. The Deuterostomia, that's our clade. Bilaterians and vertebrates 
um, account for 95% of animal species. They are morphologically diverse and accompany almost every habitat on Earth. This morphological diversity is mirrored by extensive taxonomic diversity. The, the uh, vast majority of invertebrate species belong to the Lophotrochozoa and the Ecdysozoa. All, a few belong to the Deuterostromia. Okay, here's the Lophotrochozoa, uh, an, an overview. Uh, include the Ectoprox, the Mollusca, um, the Annelida. Okay, uh, there are different uh, annelids that, that, that occur out there. Some of them are pretty amazing. Um, the Ecdysozoa, these are animals that uh, shed their skin, Ecdysis. Um, it includes the nematodes and the arthropods. Uh, and the Deuterostomia, including the Hemichordata and uh, the Echinodermata, and for some reason they didn't include the the, the Chordata is also falls into this category, into this clade. Okay, so all right, uh, this organism is uh, the Ectoprocta. It li it lives as a sessile colony. Most species have a hard exoskeleton studied with pores and ciliated tentacles that extend through the pores and trap food into the and from the surrounding water. Okay, if you want more information about this, um, read on page 535 in your textbooks. I'm going to skip through these. Okay, now we're going to talk a little bit about arthropods, very important uh, animals. Two out of every three known species of animals are arthropods. Okay, so basically the insects, and, um, and the arthropod means joint-footed. So if you have arthritis, you have, um, you have uh, pain in your, in your arth, in your joints. So arthropod means joint-footed. So it includes everything like crabs and lobsters and spiders and bugs and ladybugs and all kinds of different uh, insects. So two out of every three known species of animals are arthropods. Members of the arthropod, the phylum Arthropoda, are found in nearly all habitats of the biosphere. The arthropod body plan consists of a segmented body, hard exoskeleton, and jointed appendages. The, this body plan dates to the Cambrian explosion 535 to 525 million years ago. Early arthropods show little variation from segment to segment. Okay, here's a fossil trilobite. It's believed to be, uh, these are, these are uh, ancient arthropods. Um, it's interesting to note that the, the closest living relative to trilobites today is the um, horseshoe crab. And horseshoe crabs uh, are common during certain seasons in the, uh, in the summer in, uh, on the Delaware beaches and on the beaches in, Ver in the eastern shore in Virginia. They like to crawl up on the beaches in massive numbers uh, where they breed. And uh, if you've ever seen a, ho a horseshoe, s horseshoe crab, uh, it's not uh, impossible to imagine that it is the closest living relative of the, of the uh, trilobite. So here's the trilobite. It shows um, in its body plan, it's got uh, distinct different types of um, parts of, of, of its structure and it's uh, in that way it's becoming more evolved than s some of the the earlier um, phyla. Arthropod evolution is characterized by a decrease in the number of segments and an increase in the appendage specialization. These spe changes may be caused by changes in Hox genes uh, sequence or regulation. Okay, so Hox genes are basically genes that um, they, uh, they govern uh, certain processes in a, an organism 
uh, that are later expressed through evolutionary um, hit through evolutionary forces in into uh, other other uh, genus and other species. So in this example, this is a um, this is a an Onchioforin, which is a uh, primitive or, or, organism that predates the arthropods, and it has a certain. If you look at the this is the embryonic uh, organism here. Um, these uh, these portions here that are lit up in red are genes that they were able to isolate the the uh, DNA of these genes and cause them to phosphoresce cause them to luminesce, and then uh, this indicates um, the presence of these UBX genes, which are uh, genes that are involved in, um, in um, creating more uh, specialized uh, tissues. And so in this animal that doesn't have a lot of specialized tissues, it has these genes for these more specialized tissues. So we can see that What's happening evolutionary in, in this case is that the, um, the, the primitive organism has the genes and then the genes are expressed through the effect of uh, natural selection uh, in the future. So the, um, the Onchioforin has an arthropod Hox genes, and the evolution of an increased body segment diversity in arthropods, it must not have been related to the origin of new Hox genes. So these these uh, Hox genes, they were already present in the primitive species, and um, so they they didn't it, it, they didn't evolve newly in the in the arthropods. They were already existing in the primitive species. That's a little complicated uh, evolutionary biology right there. But if you're interested in learning more about that, uh, page five thirty six uh, on the inquiry section twenty seven point twelve will give you a little bit more information about that. Bilaterine radiation, the aquatic vertebrates. The appearance of large predatory animals and the explosive radiation of bilaterian invertebrates radically altered life in the oceans. One type of animal gave rise to the vertebrates, one of the most successful groups of animals. Okay, this is a primitive uh, uh, chordate that gave rise to the that this lineage probably gave rise to the vertebrates. Uh, its name is Mylocunamingia. It is a 530 million year old uh, chordate. The animals called vertebrates get their name from the vertebrae, a series of bones that make up the backbone. Vertebrae are, vertebrates are members of the phylum chordata. Chordates are bilaterian animals that belong to the clade of animals known as Deuterostomia. All chordates share a set of derived characters. Some species have some of these traits only during embryonic development. Four key characters of, co of chordates include a notochord, which is a flexible rod uh, providing support, okay, um, a dorsal or hollow nerve cord, uh, pharyngeal slits or pharyngeal clip, clefts which function in filter feeding as gills or as parts of the head and a muscular post anal tail. Now if you look at yourself you probably say I don't have many of these traits. We have a spinal cord which is uh, kinda like a dorsal hollow nerve cord or a notochord but we don't have pharyngeal slits or pharyngeal clefts which give rise to gills. But we do have um, uh, in, during our embryonic phase, uh, the, uh, the human embryo actually does have pharyngeal clefts. So, um, and, it, uh, and we also, as embryos, we have a post-anal tail. And like in that um, lecture I gave about uh, um, evolution, we do, uh, there, occasionally people are born with a post-anal tail. But for the most part, um, it's, it's a vestigial structure. But we do have all these characteristics, not necessarily in our adult form, though, but throughout uh, the embryonic development. Okay, here's the schematic of a, um, 
of a, a uh, ancient uh, chordate or perhaps a living chordate like uh, the lancelet. Um, here uh, we see the, um, let's start at the top and work down. Here's the dorsal hollow ner nerve cord. This is a unique structure that develops into the brain and spinal cord in other animals. And they have a, a, a central solid nerve cord. So this is like the basis of the central nervous system. Here's your brain up here. This is your this is like your oldest ancestor. This is like your great 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 grandmother. All the way back, all the way back. Okay, so here's the region that develops into the brain. Here's the central nervous system, the spinal cord. The notochord is a flexible rod that support that provides skeletal structure. Okay, this this here ultimately will turn into the vertebrae. Um, the vertebrate column, um, but right now it's just a, in these primitive species, it's just a notochord. Um, there are muscle segments um, in here, and then there is a post anal tail. Here's the anus, and here's the post anal tail, uh, the muscular tail that extends posterior to the anus. In other animals, the digestive tract runs the whole length of the body. Okay, so in, in, in like your uh, annelids, like your earthworm, they eat here and they poop out here, okay, back at the end of the tail. But uh, in, in the chordates, they, uh, they, the anus is structured here, and then you have the post-anal tail extending beyond that. Pharyngeal slits or clefts in adult structures that, that structure filter feeding as gills or as parts of the head. Okay, so these pharyngeal slits or, or clefts, like, basically you do have them as an embryo and uh, bits and parts of these uh, uh, through evolutionary uh, processes and time and do, evolving into higher animals. Um, some of these pharyngeal slits will begin to form the basis of a jaw. Um, you know, they, they form different parts of the... Of the um, of the of the body okay so we do have these uh, traits but they're just uh, disguised or they're no longer in, in, in our embryonic stage all chordates possess the four highlighted structural trademarks at some point during their development lancelets are a basal group of extant blade-like animals that closely resemble the idealized chordate they just uh, they look just like uh, this before, and what they do is they will they they uh, bury themselves into the sand up to their neck, and then that that's where they they try to inhale their prey into little protists or small microorganisms into them, and then in, expel them through their anus, and then the rest of this is so like it's sand up to the neck. Tunicates are another early diverging chordate group, but they only display display key chordate traits during their larval stage. Okay, so tunicates, um, when you look at a tunicate, it's, it's, it doesn't look at anything like a chordate, but uh, it is a chordate in its, um, in its larval trait. It looks just like a lancelet in its larval, larval trait. The ancestral chordate may have looked similar to a lancelet. Okay, so here's a lancelet. Um, it's just, uh, here it is, it's buried in sand. Um, sticks its mouth up and it inhales water and draws water uh, and and tries to consume uh, small microorganisms that way. And here's a chordate. Um, the embryonic chordate is uh, it draws it draws uh, water in through here and that passes water out through there. It's like a big it's like a big pump right here. Draw water in, pump water out, and it traps microorganisms there. And the um, the the, the uh, remnants of the larval structure are here. You can see there's a head and a tail. So tunicates are really interesting uh, organisms. There are some free swimming tunicates that attain lengths of over 60 feet as they work as colonies. Um, uh, mostly they occur on, they live on rocks. They have like a little attachment point where they uh, stick onto a rock and they stay there for the rest of their lives. But they're interesting organisms, and they're distant relatives to us. 
Okay, here's the uh, lancelet in greater detail. You can see it's almost see-through. It's got muscle structure here. Uh, the notochord and the uh, and the uh, dorsal hollow nerve cord. In addition to the features of all chordates, early vertebrates had a backbone and a well-defined head with sensory organs and a skull. Fossils representing the transition to vertebrates formed during the, the Cambrian explosion. Okay, so the Cambrian explosion was a very important time. It's when we had greater uh, diversity. The bilaterians uh, really um, became into their own and then ultimately it gave rise to some of the uh, primitive chordates, which get, then gave rise to the vertebrates. Early vertebrates were more efficient at capturing food and evading predators than their ancestors. Earliest vertebrates were conodonts, soft-bodied, jawless animals that hunted prey and using a set of barbed hooks in their mouth. There are there are only two extant lineages of jawless fish today, the hagfishes and the lampreys. Okay, so here is, uh, here is uh, our ancestral lineage in a little more detail. Okay, um, back here are the chordates. The chordates evolve into the vertebrates. Um, the vertebrates are, uh, follow these lineages here. The Mixinae, the Hagfishes, the Petromysodontidae, the Lampreys. Um, uh, these are our, our most distant relatives. Um, <clears throat> hagfishes are kind of interesting. They produce an abundance of slime, and that slime is being is uh, made of uh, proteins, and they're trying to use that slime to look at uh, different. Uh, different possible materials that they could use for like biodegradable um, packaging or uh, it might have medical uses. Uh, they're really interesting. I urge you to go on YouTube and look up uh, hagfishes and you'll see some pretty weird stuff there. Um, lampreys, okay, actually I'm going to wait. I think we're going to go through these in a little bit greater detail here. Uh, Chondriaxes, these are the, these are the um, uh, cartilaginous fish, sharks and rays. You know, everybody knows what cartilage is, right? That's the, that's like the material in your nose that you can wiggle back and forth. That's cartilage. The chondrichthyes are sharks, rays, and chimeras. The actinopterygii. These are the ray fin fishes. Um, these are common fishes that uh, you know, like bass and sunfish and the fish that we're all uh, familiar with. Actinestiae, these are the lobe-finned fishes, which include the coelacanths. The dipnoi, which are the lung fishes. They are fishes that are actually capable of breathing air and traveling across um, uh, land for short distances. And then ultimately that gives rise to the tetrapods, the amphibians, reptiles, and mammals. Okay, here's the greater detail of this uh, of this. Uh, table here exploring vertebrate diversity. Uh, this phylogenetic hypothesis shows the relationships among clades of vertebrates. Derived characters are listed for some clades. For example, only nathostomes have a jaw. In some lineages, derived traits have been lost over time or occur in reduced form. For example, hagfishes and lampreys are vertebrates with highly reduced vertebrae. Okay, they also don't have jaws. Okay, Mixinae, the hagfish, they're really weird. Check them out. Uh, they, they eat dead things that fall to the bottom of the sea. And uh, they produce tons and tons of slime in those pores that you see uh, wrapped around their bodies. Those tiny little white dots. Those... Uh, produce slime. These are the uh, the lampreys. The lampreys uh, have a fearsome, they're jawless fishes, so they don't have jaws, but they do have the ability to attach onto the side of fish. They're parasites, and they will attach onto the side of a fish, like in the Great Lakes, so particularly of freshwater predators, uh, freshwater parasites. They attach onto the, to the fish of the Great Lakes, 
and uh, they will just kind of burrow in there with their teeth. They don't have jaws, so they just kind of suck on them and give it greater and greater suction and pump up and down until they attain a hole in the side of the fish, and then they just kind of suck the juices out of the fish. That's the lamp. That's what the lamprey does. Okay, these are the chondrichthys, the cartilaginous fish that includes uh, sharks and um, rays. Um, these are all, uh, you know, they're obviously jawed fish because everybody's seen that movie Jaws. That's what it's about. But these are the cartilaginous fish are primitive. Uh, ancestors that they the great adaptation that they came up with was uh, the jaw okay actinoraptorigae actinoapterigae I always have a hard time saying that one actinoapterigae these are the ray finned fishes um, this is a lionfish here uh, lionfish are actually um, they're actually uh, invasive um, species in uh, in the Caribbean they're originally from uh, the Pacific, but they found their way. Uh, people have let them go from their aquariums into the uh, Caribbean water system, and they eat a lot of the, the fish that are there that uh, are not able to defend against them. Um, they're like a novel predator, so they eat up a lot of the uh, indigenous fish. And they have these... Uh, ray fins that stick out and in this case these fins are uh, they all are all tipped with poison so if you try to grab onto a lionfish with your bare hands you'll get stuck with these fins and it'll it will so they have no they have no natural predators so they're just they reproduce at a, an accelerated rate they lack predators and they they are novel predators themselves so they eat a lot of the the uh, local fish anyway that's ray fin fishes now these are the lo the actinischia. These are actinischia are the lobe finned fishes, and uh, this particular fish is called the coelacanth. Until about the 1970s, they thought that it was an extinct species. Um, they they thought it existed only in the fossil record. And then off the coast of Madagascar, some fisherman was doing some deep water trawling, and he caught uh, a a uh, coelacanth. And this coelacanth was uh, uh, a, a complete surprise to science. So they brought it up, and they and um, they were like, "Oh my gosh, this is amazing! It's a living fossil." So that that is one of the lobe fin fishes. And if you look at the at the the uh, fins on a lobe fin fishes, they have a different structure than the ray fin fishes. They have what looks like uh, primitive hand parts. So these um, these traits eventually gave rise to the tetrapods. So the lobe fin fishes, the important thing, thing about them is that they eventually gave rise to the tetrapods. Okay, here's the dipnoi. These are the lung fishes. Um, they, uh, they're pretty weird, but they can uh, actually breathe air. They live in uh, some areas that have, uh, uh, in, in this case, these uh, lobe fin fishes live in Africa. And what happens is uh, the, the rains come and they uh, make these ponds and then the fish come up and they swim around in the ponds and then the ponds dry up over the course of the drought and the um, drought, uh, the, the lobe fin fishes, the dipnoi, will dig into the, they'll burrow into the mud and then uh, they'll stay in that mud and wait until the next rain. So it could be years, could be a couple of years and they, and they, they, they're able to survive through reduced metabolism and then the rains come and then they, they pop out of their shelter in the, in the mud and they, um, they then become, uh, you know, they become air breathing fishes. They can move from one location to another. They can find their way back to a pond. And the tetrapods, okay, the tetrapods are uh, all, the, everything that we, when we say animals, we think of mammals generally and and uh, you know animals really encompasses this really large um, portion of living things uh, everything from the sponges up to the tetrapods but the tetrapods are the most advanced mammals are the most advanced animals and that is that is our clade we are part of the tetrapods 
Today, jawed vertebrates or nathostomes outnumber jawless vertebrates. Early nathostome successes is likely to uh, is likely due to adaptations for predation, including paired fins and tails for efficient swimming and jaws for grasping prey. Here's a here's a primitive nathostome. A a formidable predator, Dunkleosteus grew up to 10 meters in length. An analysis of the jaw structure concluded that Dunkleosteus could exert a force of over 8,000 pounds per square inch at the tip of its jaws. Nathostomes diverged into three surviving lineages, the chondriates, the ray-finned fishes, and the lobe fins. Okay, incidentally, back in the olden days, we used to talk about the chondriacthes and the osteacthes. So chondriacthes were the uh, cartilaginous fish and osteacthes were the bone fish. You know, you know the term osteo, like osteoporosis or osteopath, um, those, that refers to bone. So there used to be the chondriacthes and the osteacthes, but in this case uh, we're using the terms chondriacthes, ray fin fishes, and low fin fishes. So they're breaking it down a little finer. Humans and other terrestrial animals are included in the lobe fins. Chondriacthenes include sharks, rays, and their relatives. The skeletons of chondriacthenes are composed of primarily of cartilage. This group includes some of the largest and most successful vertebrate predators. Ray fin fishes include nearly all the familiar aquatic osteacthenes. Okay, there's the term, osteacthenes. The vast majority of vertebrates belong to the clade of nathostomes called osteaxes. Nearly all osteaxians have a bony endoskeleton. Lobe fins are the other ma major lineage of osteaxians. A key derived trait in the lobe fins is the presence of rod-shaped bones surrounded by thick layer of muscle in their pectoral and pelvic fins. These lineages survive, the coelacons, the lung, lung finches, fishes, and the tetrapods. Te terrestrial vertebrates with limbs and de digits. Okay, so that's the, what I was telling you about. The lobe fin lineage gives rise to the tetrapods. Several animal groups have features facilitating their colonization of land. Some bilaterian animals colonized land following the Cambrian explosion and causing profound changes in terrestrial communities. Early land animals. Members of many animal groups made the transition to terrestrial life. Arthropods were among the first animals to colonize the land about 450 million years ago. Vertebrates colonized land 565, 365 million years ago. Okay, when we think about os, uh, uh, arthropods colonizing the land, I like to think of ghost crabs, like when you go to the beach and you see those little white crabs and they dig holes in the in the sand up by the uh, up above the strand line towards the uh, dunes. The, the, they like to live near the dune vegetation, and uh, that's what I think of as these primitive arthropods. They were probably like crabs that moved into those regions right on the beach area. And then they evolved to inhabit more uh, available ecological niches and they became the, um, the rest of the arthropods, like the beetles and spiders and what have you. Okay, so um, arthropods were among the first animals to colonize the land about 450 million years ago, and vertebrates colonized the land about 365 million years ago. Okay, so arthropods beat us there, but we got there and eventually we evolved and, you know, we're pretty cool now. The evolutionary changes that accompanied the transition to terrestrial life were much less extensive than in animals than in plants. Okay, so um, here's a table. Uh, you can find this on page 540. Um, this chart identifies some of the key characteristics that enable three major groups of terrestrial 
organisms, the land plants, insects, and terrestrial vertebrates to live on land. Red type indicates adaptations that have evolved since the lineages derived, diverged from their aquatic ancestors. In land plants, most terrestrial adaptations evolved after the split. In contrast, two clades of the two clades of terrestrial animals, the insects and the vertebrates, display many of the ancestral characters that facilitated their transition to life on land. Okay, so um, plants had to do a lot of evolving uh, different traits um, in order to uh, obtain uh, dominance on land. Uh, insects, uh, all they basically had to do is develop the ability to breathe air. And then um, uh, ver vertebrates, um, they had uh, derived limbs and derived uh, uh, protection against desiccation. Uh, in their eggs and in, in this, you know, scales and different forms of, of on their dermal protection against uh, desiccation. Okay, so so most of the evolutionary traits for land animals had already evolved in the aquatic species, and it was just a matter of evolving more details into the available ecological niches. Whereas plants had to do a whole bunch of evolving. Colonization of land by arthropods. Terrestrial lineages have arisen in several different arthropod groups, including millipedes, spiders, crabs, and insects. The appendages of some living arthropods are modified for functions such as walking, feeding, sensory reception, reproduction, and defense. Okay, many of the distinctive features of arthropods are apparent in this dorsal view of a lobster. The body is segmented, but this characteristic is obvious only in the abdomen. The appendages, including the antenna, pincers, mouth parts, walking legs, and swimming appendages, are jointed. The head bears a pair of compound multi-lens eyes, each situated in a movable stalk. The whole body, including appendages, is uh, covered by an exoskeleton. The body of an arthropod is completely covered by the cuticle. An exoskeleton made the layers of protein and polysaccharide chitin. The exoskeleton provides... Chitin is, by the way, the same material that fungus uses. The exoskeleton provides a structural support and protection from physical harm and desiccation. A variety of organs specialized for gas exchange have evolved in arthropods. In insects, and their relative, relatives include more species than all other life forms combined. They live in almost every terrestrial habitat and, every, and in fresh water. Okay, there are many different forms of, uh, of insects. Uh, there's the um, butterflies, the lepidopterans, butterflies and mosses, moths, moths and uh, they form... Um, they have a complete uh, transformation between their uh, juvenile phase and the adult phase. Um, the hemineptorans are the true bugs. Uh, they have uh, they undergo go, uh, various phases of metamorphosis. And the hymenopterans, these are the wasps and uh, ants and bees. And uh, hymenopterans, in particular, include uh, wasps. Okay, um, they're beautiful. I'm not going to, there's not too much. If you want to learn more about them, they can turn to page 541. There's actually, there's a lot of information here, but I can't get into it in, in, this, uh, in this short lecture. Insects diversified several times following the evolution of flight adaptation to feeding on gymnosperms and the, and the expansion of angiosperms. Insect and plant diversity declined during the Cretaceous extinction, but has been increasing 
the, in, 600, in the 65 million years since. Flight is one of the one key to the great success of insects. An animal that can fly can escape predators, find food, and disperse to new habitats much faster than an organism that can only crawl. Here's a ladybird beetle, and uh, it's amazing. Their, their wings, they just roll them up inside under that shell, and then they pop them out and they go fly. One of the most significant events in vertebrate history was when the fins of some lobed fin fishes evolved into the limbs and feet of tetrapods. Remember the lobed fin coelacanth and the lungfish? Eventually their fins uh, evolved into the limbs and feet of tetrapods. Tiktaalik is a very famous um, fossil that was found uh, in the last 20 years uh, by a bunch of uh, Harvard um, paleontologists. They found it up in Canada and the, the, the Tiktaalik is a um, it's a fossil between it's a transition fossil fossil so it's like Archaeopteryx is a transition fossil between reptiles and birds Tiktaalik is a transition fossil between fish and um, and tetrapods so Tiktaalik named uh, nicknamed the fishapod shows both fish and tetrapod characteristics it had fins a gills a neck uh, and scales it had ribs to breathe and support its body it had a neck and shoulders it had fins with a bone pattern and, and a tetrapod limb okay the neck is kind of important because uh, if you know you, like there's no fish fish don't have necks they have their heads just go fuse right into their bodies so when you start developing a neck, it means that you're kind of looking around. You may be looking up, you're looking down, you're watching out for predators, you're looking for your prey. Um, these are um, adaptations uh, that became important in in uh, the vertebrates. So uh, in the in the um, in, in the uh, tetrapod lineages. So ultimately, this ability to move your head around is in, important. Okay, so <clears throat> here are the characteristics of the Tiktaalik. Uh, it had scales, fins, and gills, and lungs. It had uh, tetrapod characteristics. It had a neck, ribs, a fin skeleton, a flat skull, and eyes on top of the skull. Okay, so instead of having eyes on the side, it had eyes on top of the skull. And this animal probably lived in the shallow water regions of some, uh, I would imagine, a freshwater stream or, or river or pond, and uh, it was able to um, look its way and try to catch probably arthropod prey, so insect prey that was li living in the shallow regions. It probably had a life's uh, history that was similar to a, a crocodilian. Okay, interestingly, the um, fin skeleton had uh, adapted certain bones like that these would eventually, remember we talk about uh, homologous traits uh, being uh, found in uh, the fossil record. Well, here's the humerus, the ulna, the wrist, elbow, and radius. All right, all of these uh, parts of these uh, bones eventually evolved into, um, into a tetrapod. Uh, hand and foot bones. Tiktaalik could most likely prop itself up on its fins, but not walk. Fins became progressively more limb-like over the evolutionary time, leading to the first appearance of tetrapods 365 million years ago. Okay, so here is uh, some of the uh, evolutionary steps on the way to the t uh, tetrapods. Uh, the white bars on the branches of this diagram place the known fossils in time. Arrowheads indicate lineages that extend to today. The drawings of extinct 
organisms are based on fossilized skeletons, uh, but the colors are fanciful. So we don't know what color these or, these animals were. But here's uh, you know an, an ancient offshoot here, the lungfishes, um, and then we start uh, following the lineage of these uh, common ancestors. Common ancestry. This is the organism, and then we follow this common ancestry. Here's Tiktaalik. It's almost got digits in its hand right here, but the uh, limbs with the digits only evolve in Acanthostega, which is probably a primitive um, uh, amphibian here. Um, Tularepton. Okay, these are uh, more. These are more and more advanced organisms, and then we get up to uh, modern day amphibians and uh, reptiles, uh, uh, amphibians and, and amnios. These include uh, the mammals here. So this is all during, uh, uh, this is ancient history here, like during the Devonian period, you know, 300, 300, 400 million years ago, the Carboniferous period, uh, 370, 400 million years ago, the Carboniferous period, this is when the great coal swamps were laid down during this period in time. Uh, the Permian, uh, this is the beginning of the all right, age of the dinosaurs here. Okay, this is all during the Paleozoic period. Okay, this table is found on uh, page 543. Okay, amphibians, uh, one of the first tetrapod lineages to evolve are re represented by about 6,150 species including salamanders, frogs, and Sicilians. Uh, amphibians are restricted to moist areas within their terrestrial uh, habitats. They do not have amnion and they have to lay their eggs in fresh water. So they're completely a tie tied to uh, aquatic systems. Okay, here are salamanders on the left. They uh, retain their tails as an adult. Uh, frogs and toads do not have tails as adult. And the Sicilian is like, it's kind of like an amphibian snake. It looks a lot like a worm. It has uh, no legs and it's um, mainly a burrowing animal. Okay, terrestrial adaptations and amniotes. All right, these are amniotes are a group of tetrapods whose living members are the reptiles, including birds and mammals. Amniotes are named for the major derived character of the clade, the amniotic egg, which contains membranes that protect the embryo. Extra embryonic membranes are the amnion, chorion, yolk sac, and the allantois, or allantoa, some people say. The the amniotic eggs of most reptiles and some mammals have a shell. Okay, so here are some of the extra embryonic membranes. Um, the allantois or allantois is the um, is the disposal sac for certain metabolic weights in in, in induced in the produced by the embryo. The chorion is the membrane between the allantois and the exchange of the allantois and exchange gases between the embryo and the air. Uh, the yolk sac is contains the yolk and the stockpile of nutrients. Other nutrients are stored in the albumin, the egg white. Uh, the albumin is this uh, region out here. Okay, the amnion is protects the embryo in the fluid-filled cavity that cushions against mechanical shock. Okay, so this is the amnion surrounding the embryo here. Uh, this is a characteristic that the amphibians don't have, and the the egg of the of the um, amniotic egg, uh, 
The embryos of reptiles and mammals form four em extra embryonic membranes. The amnion, chorion, yolk sac, and allantois. The, this diagram shows these membranes in, in, the sh in the shelled egg of a reptile. Okay, so obviously in mammals um, that uh, there is a, uh, this is the attachment point of the, of the umbilical cord, so there is no yolk sac in, in, uh, in mammals, except for in uh, platypus and the echidna, but in like most mammals, they don't, we don't have the yolk sac, we just have the attachment point right there, and then the placenta, you know, the placenta reaches to, out to the um, womb of the mother. Okay, that's a whole different story, we'll probably go over that uh, in a later chapter. The origin and radiation of amniotes. Living amphibians and amniotes split from the common ancestor about 350 million years ago. Early amniotes were more tolerant of dry conditions than early tetrapods. The earliest amniotes were small predators with sharp teeth and long jaws. <clears throat> okay, so like basically little lizards, they got to be more independent of water. So we came from the water, but the objective in life seems to become more and more independent of the water. Reptiles are one of two living lineages in amniotes. Members of the reptile clade include the tuataras, lizards, snakes, turtles, crocodilians, birds, and some extinct groups. Okay, well, look at this. This is the... Um, the reptile clade consists of five groups with living members shown below, along with extinct groups such as the plesiosaurs, pterosaurs, non-flying dinosaurs. The, the dotted line indicates the uncertain relationship of turtles to other reptiles. Okay, so we, it, it's not really certain where uh, turtles fall on this phylogenetic tree. But basically, okay, these are uh, extinct plesiosaurs, crocodilians live, and birds live. And all these other um, dinosaurs that lived in between are now extinct. So what we can say that's an interesting thing to say is that uh, crocodiles are the closest living relatives to birds. Okay, and... Uh, and if you take a look at birds, if you look at the uh, feet of a bird, like if you look at, I don't know if you eat chicken feet, but if you look at chicken feet, you can see that they are they have scales. They are reptiles. This is on uh, this table is on page uh, five forty five. Okay, crocodilians, uh, tuataras. Tuataras are an ancient lineage. Um, they actually have a, uh, a third eye on their forehead that's able to detect light, but it's, uh, it's, it's, not, an, it's not like an eyeball. It's just like a light-sensitive area. Um, they're really primitive organisms, tuataras. They're, you know, they, an offshoot of a, they, they were alive during the time of the dinosaurs. Squamates include snakes and lizards. Uh, snakes and lizards are closely related. Snakes are just uh, highly evolved lizards without what they have lost their legs. Uh, snakes, uh, birds, uh, birds are interesting organisms. Uh, they have a number of uh, adaptations for flight, including hollow bones and uh, turtles. I don't know much too much about turtles. There's some turtles live on land while others live in freshwater or marine habitats and all are air breathing. Okay, crocodilians, a very ancient lineage. Uh, they, they survived the uh, extinction period of the dinosaurs and nobody really knows how or why. But for whatever reason, uh, the crocodilians are some of the most ancient lineage of, of uh, reptiles. Birds, uh, this is the classic bald eagle. Uh, you can see the structure of the bones. They're actually, they're not solid like mammal bones are. Uh, they, they have a uh, hollow structure uh, with little uh, fibers that uh, travel in between. The, these are all bone structures, but they're made to make the bones very light, so make the bird adaptive for flight.
Reptiles have scales that create waterproof barrier. Most reptiles lay shelled eggs on land. Most reptiles are ectothermic, absorbing external heat as a main source of body heat. Birds are endothermic, keeping the, keeping the body warm through metabolism. Mammals are the other extant lineages of amnios. There are many distinctive traits of mammals, including mammary hair that produce milk, mammary glands that produce milk, hair, a uh, fat layer under the skin, a high metabolic rate due to endothermy, and differentiated teeth. The first true mammals evolved from synapsids. Remember, they was like the... Uh, related to the Demetrodon that arose about uh, 180 million years ago. By 140 million years ago, three lineages of mammals had uh, emerged. Monotremes, which are the egg-laying mammals like echidnas and platypus. Marsupials are animals with a pouch like uh, kangaroos and possums. And eutherians like our placental mammals like giraffes and lions and humans. Okay, here's a monotreme. Uh, this is an echidna from Australia. Uh, marsupial, um, uh, uh, kangaroo from Australia. A eutherian, this is an ar uh, orangutan from Borneo. Okay, this is, uh, I think I'm gonna show this image a little closer. Here's the echidna here. Here's the echidna's egg um, hatching out. You can see a little baby echidna uh, right in the middle there. So that echidna baby hatches out from the egg and then it goes and attaches onto the nipple of the mother and it feeds on the nipple until it's old enough to travel on its own. Here's the marsupial, the kangaroos, uh, just like other marsupials, they give birth to a, it looks like a premature offspring and then that premature offspring, uh, the tiny little pink baby will go and attach to a nipple inside the pouch of the mother and the um, and the uh, it'll stay there until it becomes old enough to travel on its own. Okay, placental mammals. Uh, the ba babies are not they're they're born um, in uh, more more developed, and then that just basically the mother has to feed the baby with its um, milk, and then until they attain a state of independence. Humans are primates nested within a group informally called apes. Okay, so here we're talking about our own lineage. So basically, the most primitive uh, primates are, are New World monkeys, uh, followed by Old World monkeys, and then there are the tailless monkeys, the gibbons, orangutans, gorillas, chimpanzees, and humans. Okay, so this is our this is our lineage. Uh, this is a very important, but I think I'm going a little long in this lecture, so I'm going to urge you to look on page 546 and uh, get a little bit uh, more information about this on your own. A number of characteristics uh, divert, distinguish humans from other apes. We have an upright posture and bipedal locomotion. We have larger brains that are capable of language and symbolic thought, artistic expression, and the use of complex tools. Okay, some other animals have these capacities as well, uh, but human beings uh, have really refined them, and and we're we're the best at it. Uh, I don't know if you ever seen the on YouTube. There's a image. Uh, there's some footage of uh, elephants that paint pictures, and they they paint pictures of themselves and you know, trees and what have you, they're, they're, they seem to be capable of symbolic thought. Um, uh, bonobos use, bonobo chimpanzees use primitive tools all the time to, uh, dig, to break into termites' nests and fish out termites. So um, these aren't really things that are unique to humans, but humans have really specialized and adapted them um, in, to a degree that other animals have not. The evolution of bipedalism preceded the evolution of increased brain size in the human ancestors. We can tell this from the fossil record. Brain size, body size, and tool use increased over time in, in the homo species. 
Modern humans, Homo sapiens, originated in Africa about 200,000 years ago and colonized the rest of the world from there. Okay, here is about a 90,000 year old fossil evidence in the Mediterranean of uh, Homo sapiens, a uh, parent and child apparently. There's a, a young child skeleton here and a, an adult skeleton here. Animals have transformed ecosystems and altered the course of evolution. So the rise of animals from the microbe-only world affected all aspects of ecological communities in the sea and on land. The oceans of early Earth likely had a very different properties than the oceans of today. They were probably murkier and poorly mixed with low oxygen and cyanobacteria and um, the cyanobacteria uh, freed up enough oxygen to allow um, the eukaryotes to prosper. Uh, the eukaryotes uh, created a clear, well-mixed, high-oxygen uh, eukaryotic algae environment. So um, the rise of the eukaryotes and the, eventually the animals um, uh, allowed for, the, for more, al more algae to exist in the seas. And this probably allowed for increased uh, elevation of oxygen production. The rise of filter feeding animals likely caused the decline of cyanobacteria and other suspended particles in the oceans during the early Cambrian. This resulted in a shift to algae as the dominant producers and changed the feeding relationships in marine ecosystems. Terrestrial ecosystems were transformed by the move of animals to land. Herbivores such as the lesser snow goose can improve the growth of plants at low population sizes but through additions of nutrient-rich wastes. Okay, so animals provide uh, nitrogen fertilization. At high population sizes, herbivores can defoliate large tracts of land. So they defoliate those land, um, they can cause... Um, changes in the ecosystem that way. Okay, so here's a, uh, an area inside of a fence which these snow geese could not uh, uh, get access to, and you can see that there's like all kinds of vegetation inside the fence. Outside of the fence, the geese basically denuded the area. They had an, uh, so animals have an, ex, uh, has an, an impressive impact on the uh, ecosystem surrounding. Okay, the origin of mobile heterotrophic animals within a complete digestive tract drove some species to extinction and in initiated ongoing arms race between bilaterian predators and prey. Two species that interact can exert strong reciprocal selective species pressures on one another. For example, a flower form can be influenced by the structure of its pollinator's mouth parts and vice versa. Okay, so here's a uh, Madagascar orchid uh, that secretes a sugary nectar at the base of its unusually long floral tube. Based on the tube's length, Charles Darwin predicted the existence of a pollinating moth with a 28 centimeter long proboscis long enough to reach the bottom of the tube. The, the, the moth was not known to exist during Darwin's time, but he predicted its existence. Uh, such a moth was shown to, uh, has dis was discovered two decades after Darwin's death. Okay, so this is called co-evolution, when the, 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 the orchid has evolved specifically to the traits of the moth, and the moth has evolved specifically to accommodate the traits of the orchid. Reciprocal selection pressure can also occur when the origin of new species in one group stimulates the further radiation in another group. For example, the origin of a new group of animals pr provides new food sources for parasites, resulting in radiations in parasite groups. Humans have made large changes to the environment and have altered the selective pressures faced by many species. For example, human targeting of a large fish for harvesting has led to the reduction in the age and size of, at which individuals reach maturity. 
So here we have, uh, as, as time goes on, we have increasing selective pressure by humans. Humans are catching, first they're only catching large cod. This is the codfish found off the coast of New England. Here we're catching the large codfish. And then uh, the population of codfish decreases in size over time. And so the, the, the age of reproduction then also increases or decreases uh, over time. So younger and younger fish, smaller and smaller smish fish have to become uh, reproductively able as time goes on as the increase in, in fishing pressure uh, increases. So uh, basically what's happening what is uh, these populations, they are adapting uh, to the increased pressure, but they're not able to... Um, smaller fish are not able to have large large enough populations so the population of fish is decreasing in time even though the fish are adapting rapid species decline over the past 400 years indicate indicate that human activities may be driving a sixth major extinction we're going to talk about this more when we and we in our section on ecology Mollusks, including pear mussel, pearl mussels, have suffered the greatest impact of human-caused extinctions. Okay, so uh, mollusks suffer disproportionately in the in the types of extinctions that are being caused by humans. Here's the uh, workers that are standing on a mound of pearl mussels. These pearl mussels occur like in the central part of the United States in the uh, Muskingum, Mississippi, Ohio rivers, um, they, that, those was the habitat of these pearl mussels and these pearl mussels were harvested extensively and, uh, and, and to the point of extinction. Okay, so uh, here are different animals that are affected by uh, re recorded extinctions, amphibians, birds, reptiles, mammals, fishes, these are all animals that are under that are being extinguished or ex forced under extinction. These are the mollusks, so they represent the largest the largest uh, group of organisms affected. The major threats imposed on species by human activities include habitat loss, pollution, and competition or predation by introduced non-native species. Okay, here's a uh, green crab, which are introduced to the Gulf Coast. Uh, there's a population of periwinkles um, uh, on the uh, uh, from southern population, southern Gulf Coast and northern Gulf Coast, and it looks like it's showing here that the the green crab is killing the southern uh, population disproportionately. If you want more information about this, uh, turn to page 549 in your textbook, Understanding Experimental Design and Interpreting Data. Basically what this is saying is that the, um, the northern periwinkles are being killed less than the southern periwinkles. So the northern periwinkles may have an adaptation. Okay, here's our timeline. Um, uh, the Paleozoic period, Mesozoic, Cenozoic. Okay, here's the Neoproterozoic. This is like the Ediacaran, the Cambrian explosion during the beginning of the Paleozoic. Um, early land animals, these are the arthropods that... Uh, around 365 million years ago. Uh, diversification, origin diversification of, of uh, dinosaurs. Okay, so um, this is a, your basic timeline here. Okay, this shows that uh, big brain birds are surviving better. Okay, their mortality rate, um, uh, the larger the expected brain size, um, you're having a decreased mortality rate, especially around this range in here. Okay, so smarter birds are living longer. 